You're tuned in to the Daily BS. Do you believe it? Sports and culture combined into one. Michael on the drive across the lane. Turnaround shot. Got it. 63 for Jordan. Are you kidding me? He did what? The Daily BS begins. Bazinga. <laughs> right now. Great. Googly moogly. Hey, this promises to be fun. Can't wait. <laughs> I've missed you guys. It's good to be back here on the Daily BS. Had to step away for a little bit because had some crazy, crazy things going on. So on all of our great networks, thank you for being patient with me. Thank you for allowing me into your home this afternoon. And I got a great show lined up for you over the next couple of hours. My thoughts on the All-Star Game rules to honor Kobe Bryant. My thoughts on the XFL William Morgan will join me to talk all things XFL and the All-Star Game and a very and a couple of very special guests. Sit back, relax, and strap it down. It's this edition of the Daily BS, and we're starting right now. We want you to follow along with Snowman Digital Media. That is the production company for this show, as well as the Daily BS, the NBA podcast, and i got a couple of others on the docket. The ID you need. Is SNW Digital Media. That's SNW Digital Media for Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, and Pinterest. And yes, we are going to use Pinterest a lot more beginning this week. I want to thank my good friend Brandon Wesley from the Unico Exclusive for housing this program. Thank you to Robert Cobb from the Inscriber Magazine for uh, distributing this program. Also, thank you to Full press coverage as well as RTF as the RTF Sports Network. Check out full press coverage at fullpresscoverage.com and rtfsportsnetwork.com. Thank you to Arena Sports Net, that is my parent com- one of my parent companies for distributing this program as well as Western Reserve Digital Radio and as as well as the iMedia One Radio Network. Well, I thought football was done after the Chiefs won the Super Bowl, but I was wrong. The XFL has returned. And I got to tell you something. I am very impressed, very, very impressed with this edition of the XFL because for the simplest of reasons, It concentrates more on the football product as well. uh, Instead, I beg your pardon, instead of all the fluff of the all the sizzle, the uh, the uh, Titan Trons, as most of you know, who watched the XFL in 2001, the stadiums were kind of set up the same way. Even the cavernous Los Angeles Coliseum, they had the fireworks and the Titan Trons and the cheerleaders and all that stuff. It gave us the sky cam, which is used by the NFL today. But I got to be honest with you. I am very impressed with this edition of the XFL because of the product that's on the field. Because of the product that it's on the field. And one of the biggest changes in this edition of the XFL is that Vince McMahon is no longer seeing day-to-day operations. For that, he called on a football mind in that of Oliver Luck. And the other thing that Vince McMahon did, and something I am taking a lesson from, he invested not only the money, but he invested an entire year of time in promoting the product and promoting the league and promoting some of the players that will be involved in the XFL, one of which is Cardale Jones, the uh, former Ohio State Buckeye who won a national championship in 2015. There are some pretty good players, very good players. One of the things I would change, you know, I, I always talk about, uh, shortening the preseason of the NFL. That's what they that's what they did. And in thinking about it just now, I wouldn't I wouldn't change that. Some of the rule changes are the kickoffs, and I absolutely love how these kickoffs work. The kickoff from the thirty yard line and what happens is the team that blocks for the returner 
and the team that charges for the kicking team, they're lined up five yards from each other, and no one moves until the ball is caught by the receiver. It encourages returns, and it also eliminates a lot of collisions that result in injuries. If you remember the XFL in 2001, what they did was they had the ball at the 50-yard line, and then two players would take off for it, and would scramble. it would be a scrum. I said scramble. It would be a scrum for the football. And that produced an immediate injury, an immediate injury that basically took out one of the players, I believe it was for the Las Vegas Outlaws, and cost him his entire season, and I don't think he ever played football again. But this one, there's actually a kickoff. And you don't get a lot of collisions. You don't get a lot. You're still going to risk injury because it is the game of football. It's the roughest sport out there. But it's not a lot of head-on collisions like there were before. It's not a lot of people coming at you in what could be the equivalent of a 100-mile-an-hour car with pads and a helmet, and they come crashing at you. It's none of that. It's an actual structured kickoff. And I think, I'm inclined to think, that some of the changes you see in the XFL, the NFL could use. And they speed up the game also. One of the rules I also love is the fact that it is not a 40-second play clock and then a 25-second game clock. No, it is always at 25 seconds. They still play 15-minute quarters. And they eliminated a timeout also. So instead of three timeouts per half, you're only allowed two. You know, one of the phrase, uh, one of the um, taglines that they use is for the love of football. And no stall, just ball. I'm actually liking this. I'm actually liking this version of the XFL. A question I posed in my head Is this version going to last? The way it looks right now, I say yes. I say the fans can get behind this version. And except for the New York Guardians who used MetLife Stadium, the Dallas Renegades who used, uh, I believe they used the Cotton Bowl, which seats 90,000, you know, they can get behind this. They can get behind this. The stadiums are smaller for the most part. And, um... You know they can they can sell out, they can actually sell out if they, if they are affordable enough. We can talk about expansion within a year to two years because some of the cities that were in the old version of the XFL that are not in the new one, uh, Chicago, San Francisco, uh, Los Angeles is still there. They were in both there in um, both versions of the XFL. I mentioned uh, New York, New Jersey. New York's there. But uh, Orlando, Memphis. But um, you have to think about some of the cities that uh, can be available. Atlanta, for one. San Diego, for another. Mention Chicago. Las Vegas could be an opportunity. There are so many opportunities for expansion with this version of the XFL than there was before. And, uh, again, the biggest part is Vince McMahon... The man who funded the league and founded the uh, production company for said league actually did his research this time. He took all the lessons from uh, the first iteration of the XFL and he put them into this current project. He put them into what's going on on the field right now. And I am truly inclined to think that this can work. I really think this could work. And what's scary is that uh, the, what's scary about this iteration of the XFL is that one, you have a possibility for expansion. 
Two, the star power that is there. I mean, I was watching one of the games, and they did an interview with Troy Aikman. They have to cut down the interviews. I mean, there are too many interviews, I think, in the NFL from the sidelines right now, trying to catch the coaches, and I understand that's the trend. I know that's not going to change. You know, Brock Heward was uh, doing doing his thing for Fox Sports, as well as Kurt Benefee, and I love the fact that there are, and I'm jumping all over the place, and I love the fact there are two major networks, two major networks, that broadcast NFL games, they jumped on board with the XFL. That is ESPN, which involves a, which includes ABC as well, and Fox Sports. And both the presentations are different. I'll get to that later on in the season. And um, I just love this iteration of it. I love it. I absolutely love it. You only have to have one foot in bounds to... Um, have it rule to catch and I think that's they use the college rule for that one foot down and you got to possess the ball I love that I love that because there are so many times there are so many definitions of what is a catch in the NFL that drives me absolutely freaking batty it does it drives me absolutely nuts now some of the other nuances that uh, I'm still learning about uh, within the final two minutes of the second quarter or the uh, regulation time um, even though you go out of bounds they run five seconds off the play clock before the game clock runs so they want to speed up the game they absolutely they, they want to speed up the game and I see that a couple of the other rules is the point after touchdown they never allowed a kick for a point after touchdown in the old version of the XFL, and they're not allowing it on this one. This one is kind of innovative to me. It still confuses the hell out of me, but this one is kind of innovative to me. And I'm going to have William Morgan join me at the um, join me after the first break to help me break down what is the XFL. In fact, he's going to join me twice during the show. I'll get to the uh, show preview in just a moment. But there are three shots. That you have. So you can pick up as much as nine points instead of just eight in the NFL or college. You can pick up as much as nine points, but there are no kicks. There are no kicks. You line up from, if I'm understanding correctly, the two yard line for a one point conversion, the five yard line for a two point conversion, and the ten yard line for a three point conversion. And on all conversions, no matter which point value you choose, you got to stick it in the end zone. You got to stick it in the end zone. The overtime rules are what got my attention. And the overtime rules, from what I understand, is this it's a shootout style setup. You know how hockey goes to after they play three periods and it's tied and they go through overtime and it's tied. And um, you, go to, you go to a shootout and each round, you go three rounds in hockey. And uh, you you have to shoot you have to score a goal, and if you get stopped more times than you score, then the other team wins. That's how they set it up in the XFL. You get one play from the five yard line. If you score and get the conversion afterwards, then the other team has one play. You play a total of five rounds, and whoever is ahead after five rounds is the winner. But if they're still tied. At the end of those five rounds, then you go to sudden death, and there are no ties in the XFL. I love that setup, and I think I'm going to love how this XFL is run. Now, of course, there's a full season yet to play, and, of course, my opinions can change from here on out, but so far, so good. So far, so good. Coming up on this edition of the program, William Morgan will join me to talk XFL, and then later on he'll join me to talk NBA All-Star Game and all things NBA. Donnell the Playmaker so, uh, Silence will join me. Rick Curdy will join me. And a very couple of very special guests will join me. Andre Day, whose program, whose podcast with the Bearded Wonder, uh, the Black and Business podcast, I had the absolute joy and pleasure to be a part of he'll join me for segment three of this hour and then a young lady by the name of jennifer garrett who became an entrepreneur after working a job for a long time she said the hell with it i'm going all in 
and she has a wonderful podcast of her own called the Move the Ball Podcast. I invited her on. She will join me. And, man, I got a lot of good stuff. Rick Curdy, you'll hear that conversation and a couple of other conversations over the course of this program. So sit back, sit back, relax, and strap it down. If I can say it right, William Morgan will join me next after the break. Welcome back to the program, folks. So, in case you don't know, football is not over. And I don't mean just because my friend Mike DeBate and I are going to talk the course of the NFL offseason. A new league launched in the form of the XFL. Yes, it is back. And I don't know what the hell's going on. I kid when I say that. <laughs> I I have to bring William Morgan back on the hotline with me. What's going on, man? How you guys doing today? Thank you for having me again. Okay. I'll repeat my question with a smile on my face and a very selfish intent to make you laugh. What the hell's <laughs> going on? Well, <laughs> opening opening oh, <laughs> opening day for opening day for the new season was yesterday, mm-hmm. um, and we had and it was a little bit smoother than it has been today. Um, I have not seen the <clears throat> the game that kicked it off today, but I'm currently watching the game right now, and it's a a tough defensive bout, battle. It looks to be yeah. But yesterday we, we had the DC defenders defeat the. Defeat my Seattle Dragons thirty-one to nineteen after all the <laughs> issues we had yesterday. Oh my goodness! Oh, we had issue after issue. But I'm sticking by my team, though. I'm sticking by my team, though. You, you're sticking right, by the. Had, and, you're, so the Seattle Dragons are your team. Yes, that's my team. That's where I'm from, and I'm sticking by my team. Um, then we also had yesterday the Houston Roughnecks behind P.J. Walker, who I call P.J. the Truth Walker. Mm-hmm. Four touchdowns. They get a big victory against the L.A. Wildcats, 37-17. to 17. Yep. So, great day yesterday. Uh, there's a lot of different rules that's come down into the XFL this year, mm-hmm. and primarily it's geared for all offense. As you can see, if you watched the games yesterday, there were no extra points. You have an equal. Nope. You can go literally <laughs> – you can go if you score a touchdown. You can go for three. If yeah. you're down by nine, you can go for three. <laughs> so you go from the two yeah. yard line for one point, mm-hmm. the five yep. yard line for two points, and the ten yep. yard line for three points. So you can literally yeah, make up eighteen points in two possessions. Yep. Okay. You really can. So they kept that. They they kept that part of it. They, they they fix the kickoffs, and I love that. There's no scramble for the kickoff for for opening possession anymore. They actually do kick it off. Field goals That's are right. still in play, but you need to explain this to me. They mm-hmm. actually are going to allow a double forward pass. Yep. How? Yep. About- and that's part. And that's part of keeping the game unique, fresh. But it's also there to make sure it's still geared toward the offense Mm -hmm. in this league as well. Mm -hmm. Now, I've seen and have been a part of backward passes that go to uh, a forward pass. How does this double forward pass work? How does it work? How does the double? I've never seen it. I've seen so many quarterbacks run across the line of scrimmage and I've seen an illegal forward pass. The only time I can honestly say that I've seen a double forward pass is in a scramble situation where you're trying to get the ball downfield, just as Drew Brees and the New Orleans Saints against your Seahawks mm-hmm. in, the, in the playoffs. It, is, is, that the, is that the concept? Yes, that's the concept of it. And, okay. and, 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 keep, it, and keep in mind, too, if you want to, your formation or your player personnel can be what player personnel could do whatever. So if you want to take out 
a tight end and put in another quarterback, you can do that. Really? Wow. Yep. yep. So now you can have two quarterbacks on the field. I've actually seen I've actually seen that happen a couple times. Okay. Mm-hmm. I had a chance to take a look at the uniforms. True or false? <laughs> The Tampa Bay Titans, and much respect to them, have the, Tampa Bay Vipers. Uh, have the uh, Vipers. Thank you. The Tampa Bay Vipers have the ugliest damn uniforms I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> That's what everybody's saying on Facebook. <laughs> I mean, I think the Washington Generals had better uniforms in the USFL than these that I've seen. And I understand them trying to highlight the green. It's a little bit of a USF motif, the University of South Florida motif, but what the hell are those? <laughs> I mean, this is, oh, wait man. a minute. You know, what's, you know what's bad? I showed my wife a picture of that uniform. She handed uh-huh. the phone right back to me and went, I don't want to see that ever again. <laughs> uh. I mean, uh, I, I know they're trying to. I, I, I look. This, these uniforms are better than some of the uniforms I saw last year in the Alliance of American Football. Let's just get that piece of truth out of the way, okay? Yes. But the Tampa Bay Make Vipers, a- you would think <laughs> they would darken the. And I don't want to make this all about the uniforms because, hey. Some of the uniforms I've seen in 2001 left a lot to be desired when the XFL premiered this time. True that. But damn. (laughs) If that's their road uniforms, I'm almost afraid, and I mean this kiddingly, I'm almost afraid to see what the home uniform's like. Oh, man. (laughs) Man. But I will I, I I will say this. These uniforms for the XFL this time around are a lot better than the ones that we saw back in 2001. So are the nicknames, yep. where they put the, where they put the teams, they concentrated on the big markets. I like how the Seattle Dragons motif is. I like that mm-hmm. combination. Oh yeah. Which brings to mind this question and I believe I know your answer. But I want to be sure I put it out there, and I'm going to make this my question of the day a little bit later on in the show. Can the XFL last beyond one season this time? Yes. That's what I thought. <clears throat> I really believe you're looking it at about you're looking at about two to three years with the money that Vince has put into it. Mm-hmm. He's, he's put a lot of he's put a lot of money into it. Another thing too that I think will make it last two three years is the fact that Vince is no longer running the day to day. That's going to Commissioner Luck. Yeah. So he's not running the day to day of the XFL. Uh, who com- Commissioner Luck is, and I really think this could last. Matter of fact, it may end up being expanded upon Mm -hmm. because right now you're looking at eight cities that are major NFL cities, but there's other cities who got left out. There's no team in Carolina. There's no team in Georgia. So, you know, we can we can get some of those teams to up this thing to 10. One movie team out in Vegas, there you go. So we can definitely do some things in XFL to definitely last beyond this season and you said the most important thing vince mcmahon is not a part of the day-to-day operation he just funded the league he said he's going to put 500 million bucks toward the league which will give it three full seasons and then he hired Mm -hmm. a football mind and oliver luck most of you should know that name especially in indianapolis okay Mm -hmm. oliver most people should know the name oliver luck i know i certainly do he hired a mm-hmm. football. He hired a football mind. When will the Cleveland Browns exactly. ever get this right? He hired a football mind to run the day-to-day operations for this league. Yes. So that's correct. As of this first weekend, it is poised for for success beyond year one. Oh yeah, most definitely. So I believe it would be I believe it would be a huge success if open today is any type of an indicator. Uh today is a little bit sluggish, a little bit slower, but hey, um I believe we too will see some more action. But you have 
two networks that are behind the XFL now instead of just one. Because if you remember, in 2001, it was all on NBC, and then NBC pulled out because they didn't like the ratings. With ESPN, yeah, with ESPN and Fox Sports, which are two major networks for the NFL, you got Mm -hmm. a better outfit this time. I really think you do. don't forget, you got your Fox, you got your ESPN, and you also have your um, your ABC, mm-hmm. um, similar to ESPN, but the same thing. You have three, you you have three major networks versus 2001. You had NBC and UPN and um, Paramount Networks. Yeah, and NBC wasn't ready at that time um, to really host something like that. That's why they probably pulled out. UPN, you know, wasn't ready. It probably. You don't really hear anything from that. I think they got bought out or something like they that. Did. Um, they did. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You put so, that you know, bought out. Yeah. So now you have three major networks that are putting time and emphasis on this thing. If you watch any Fox programming, particularly early in the morning, like if you watch First Things First, they will actually push these games on that show. Yeah. So that tells you that they are they are committed to it and want to see it succeed. Yeah. Yeah, and I do, too. This is what I opened the show with. I do, too. I want to see this succeed now. And I mentioned this at the top of the program. Oliver Luck being in charge is huge. Vince McMahon staying out of the day-to-day operations. And give kudos to Vince McMahon. He learned his lesson. And Mm -hmm. unlike the AAF, he took a full two years to put this together. Yep. Yep. He took a he, sure they did. he took a full two years to put this together. This is William Morgan joining me talking all things XFL. Stand by, folks. He's going to be back later in the show to talk all things NBA All Star Game, and I can't wait to bring him back because I got some questions for him. So if you'll hop on later in the show, I'll be glad to have you. Got gotcha, you, man. Stand by, folks. I got more for you after this. With this being Black History Month, I'm going to return the favor. On the hotline with me is one of the fellows who's in charge of said podcast. This is Andre Day, and he joins me right now. How are you, my friend? I'm doing fantastic, my brother. How are you? I am doing great. First of all, let me say thank you from the bottom of my heart for um letting me come on to your podcast and spreading some knowledge and spreading some love for the other podcasters, the other independent show hosts that, that do this just, just like we do. I can't thank you enough for that. Man, listen, I tell you, I can't thank you enough for being on the show because you, you gave more than what I even thought was going to be given. Like I thought it was going to be like, you know, regular run of the mill and then we end by spreading love and showing love to brothers and almost putting us to tears man so i thank you a whole bunch for that thank you for being on the show that was one of the things i really wanted to touch on and it's something you know my wife tells me all the time she says maybe that can be part of your message as well as you having fun doing your sports show maybe you can drive that point home and this is the point that i've driven home you know, for the time that she and I have been together and for a while now, there is not enough help out there in many ways for men. Let's take color out of the equation. There's not enough help out there for men who need to get back on their feet, who desire to get back on their feet, and for those who who want to who, who want to stay on their feet. That's why I love talking about that particular message. And I'm glad you helped me spread that message when I was on your when I was on your show. 
Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, one of the things, um, and also one of the reasons that caused me to start the show was I wanted to uh, spread a message, not only for African Americans, but also just for the wider generation in general. Um, a lot of individuals my age, both male and female, I don't believe they have the same drive that people before us had. Um, and then also in, with that, a lot of people don't get, like you said, enough um, assistance to start. Um, and I believe it starts from like when we grow up where we're taught certain things and then just kind of let go. And then just uh, like, oh, you're an adult, you can do it. But you get a totally different, um, uh, let me see, you get like a totally different viewpoint of what adulthood is. And then when you kind of reach back out for help, there's nobody there to help you. So, I mean, spreading love and, and showing love to men is something that we need to do every day. Like every moment of every day you have, say I love you to a man, it'll help out a whole lot. And this is what a lot of men don't get. Well, a lot of men get it, but they don't voice it aloud. And I was guilty of, of such. Um, mm -hmm. I said I love you to my dad and my granddad and my uncles every day that they were here. You know, they've all passed on now. But I don't mind one bit saying I love you to a man who is very close to me. There are some broadcasters who I say it to, and I say it live on this show. I don't think it's not I don't think it's a bad thing at all. In fact, it's a wonderful thing to communicate that for men to communicate that to each other without having this two PC world misconstrue why we're saying that to each other. It needs to be said a lot more often. Yeah. And I think also it needs to be said in um in a way where when you say it, you say it with confidence. I feel like if I say it to you, I'm only going to say it when it's only you and I. Like, you know, certain people don't want other people to know that I said I love you. But it shouldn't be that way. Just as well as it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you show affection and love to your wife. People don't want to see that, but you don't care because it's between you and your wife. So I think the same thing should be from man to a man. Like, if I love you, I don't have a problem with giving you a hug, showing you affection, saying I love you, say I appreciate you, um, taking care of you, things of that nature. And it really doesn't matter what other people say or how they look at me or what they may think because it's not for them to, like, it, it's not for them. It's for me and you. So as long as you and I have the understanding, I can honestly care less about what other people think. And that's it's what... really where I think a lot of people don't show it is because they believe or think, oh, I don't want this person to think differently of me or what this person might say. And it really is affecting you more than what you may know. It really is. It really does affect the person that, you know, thinks aloud and thinks constantly about what other people think. I've had to learn from other people, my wife included, and uh, my daughter and my son included, you know, you can't think about what people say or think about you that's just going to affect you do i have my days mm -hmm. where i slip back into that absolutely and i say that I, I say that aloud and i say that with conviction because i'm still learning a lot from my wife and her family and i'm learning a lot about myself at the same time being on your show where i was allowed to express what i felt and not just in the sports world but just in life mm -hmm. that that meant a lot to me. I can't thank yeah. you and your partner enough for allowing that to happen and allowing that message to be spread. That needs to be that needs to be spread more often. So if men can communicate like that, do you know how different this country, let alone this world, <laughs> will be? I think people are afraid of what might happen. Um, when I grew up, I saw a lot of. Um, things in person and a lot of things that are on TV that don't really show men loving each other. So adults now that are in my age bracket, you know, late twenties, early to mid thirties, don't have that. I love you type of mentality. So what happens in turn is that you have an issue, you deal with it by yourself 
And then when you don't know how to get the results you need to make a better outcome for yourself, you start lashing out and doing things that you normally wouldn't do. So to answer your question, if we express love to one, one another more often, I think we would have, number one, happier individuals. And number two, we would be able to think more clearly and start doing things that would help us with a better life instead of putting us where we are in that mentality of crabs in a, a barrel trying to keep everybody down we would want to see everybody move up so i think it would have an effect that i don't think um the world is ready for on the african-american side like if we really put our minds together and stick to one another i think we can be actually i know we can be a force to be reckoned with where did you grow up let's find out more about andre where'd you grow up well my um i grew up in um new york i'm originally from brooklyn both my parents are uh from new york um i lived in new york for about seven or eight years or so maybe a little bit longer than that um and then i moved to new jersey for about a year or two and um after new jersey i moved to maryland um and i've been here in the maryland dc area since uh let's say ninth grade or so ninth or tenth grade yeah wow so you're you're originally from new york i can i can hear that accent come out (laughs) where's your where's your sports loyalties lie which teams get you at the heart well i am a football fan so my first team at heart would be the giants um, Good man. <laughs> I also like I also like to see the Jets every once in a while, just because they're also New York. Um, I I don't really watch a lot of baseball, but um, it it does feel nice and feel good to see the Yankees do something well. Mm-hmm. Um, and other than that, I you know I would say basketball. I was into the Celtics, but after they dismantled the uh, Kevin Garnett and the uh, Paul Pierce and Ray Allen, I kind of spread away from the Celtics right now. I'm just kind of open. I like kind of any basketball team as long as it's a good game. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't really watch a lot of hockey, but people tell me I need to get into it because it's a really good and interesting sport. Um, and that's really about it for sports. Now, I'm going to tease you because... I do have love for the New York football giants. I loved it (laughs) back in the day when Bill Parcells and Bill Walsh would hook up and go at it, be it at at the old Giants Stadium or at old Candlestick Park. Um, You're not not into basketball that much? Not like I used to, no. Um, Like I said, I used to to be a Celtics fan, but once they dismantled that, that amazing team, I just kind of, I don't know, I went away. Good. Then I can say Michael Jordan and get away with it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. My, hey, listen. Even though you don't watch basketball, you know who Michael Jordan is. Yes. Like, Thank you. Thank he was, you. He was on the Wheaties box. He was on every magazine. I mean. He was all walk over the in place. Any country, yeah. You walk into any country and say MJ, there's only one person that, I mean, they might do Michael Jackson, but. Only those two have MJ. There's no other right. MJs that are prominent in everybody's mind. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, you're fine so with Michael Jordan. That's cool. So, so yeah. true. And I've I've spoken to a couple of hardcore Knicks fans, and I kid them a lot. And I said, well, I guess I can't say Michael Jordan, and they start growling at me. But then we we all start laughing <laughs> laughing at it. But I love having conversations like this during the show that you know gives people the other side of the shows and the podcasts that I do. So that's why I wanted to I wanted to bring you on and you got to tell me how you got how did you get your podcast started? Well, in um a previous job I had, I was just kind of sitting in the office and um it was a Friday afternoon I believe. And I'm just sitting there pondering like, you know, what else can I do besides work 
every day, same job, Monday through Friday, and sometimes on Saturday, and just go home. Like, there has to be something else I can do. So I started just thinking, like, you know, I'm not really putting my business degree into play because this job that I had at that time, really anybody can do. Um, and I really wasn't doing much of a, like a side hustle per se. So my uh, supervisor at the time walked through the door. And as soon as he walked through the door, a light bulb came into my head. And I was like, ooh, I can do something that promotes small businesses, but how can I do it? So, you know, I, I, I sleep on it. I think about it for a couple of days and I go, well, I can do a podcast. Well, how do I do one? I did my research. And once I found out that you can literally start a podcast for free, it was no brainer after that. All the thing I needed was people to have on the show. Um, as long as you have an email address and a place to host, your podcast, it's essentially free. You don't have to buy anything. Um, you can do it from your phone. You can do it from your laptop. I think the only thing that you may need to buy if you want to get fancy is a microphone. Yeah. But everything else is essentially free. Um, so once I got that idea, I just started reaching out to people and letting them know, like, hey, I want to start a podcast and, you know, uh, promote small business owners and kind of discuss with them how they started and um, you know, what they do to keep themselves going and things of that nature. And, um, you know, I got a few people to say, Hey, yeah, no problem. I'll be in your show. And I was kind of taken back like, Oh, really? You want to be in my show? So, okay. Uh, okay. Like I was kind of nervous at that point, but then I, I said, this is what I wanted to do. Um, and I did it. So it just kind of went from there. Well, I am very proud of you. I am very proud to have uh, been a guest on your podcast. You and I share a mutual friend, Stephen Askins, of the Inside mm -hmm. uh, Foot, uh, Inside Football Blitz. He was on your program, and he was the reason he was the guy that led me to you and led me to your podcast. So I am very, very proud to be a guest on your podcast. I'm proud to have you on on this show, and tell everybody where they can find you, my friend. Oh, so they can find me. I would say the easiest way is to um, you can email us at um, Black and Business Podcast at gmail dot com. They can find us on Facebook, which is Black and Business Podcast. It can also be found on Instagram, which is Black underscore in business, and um, we're located at um, you know on Apple iTunes. Google iTunes, I mean, Google uh, Podcast. We're on, um, what is that other one? Uh, Spotify. And I believe those are the three major ones. I mean, we're on some other smaller ones I can't think of right now, but those are the, the three major ones at this point. Hey, folks, check out the Black in Business podcast. I was a guest on it. If you know someone that has a small business, and this is Black History Month, if you know someone that has a small business, and they want to get featured, this is the guy you contact, this is the podcast that you're on, and you get featured on this show as well. Andre Day, one half of the Black and Business podcast, joining me here on the program. I can't thank you enough, and I recommend to the folks again, I recommend to the community, please go check out the Black and Business podcast. Thank you for your time, my friend. I can't wait to have you back on. I appreciate it. And before I go, I just want to give a shout out to my co-host, uh, Bearded Wonder. Um, he's, once you guys listen to the show, you'll see why he's such an awesome person. And, um, I'm glad to have him as a co-host and I can't wait to just continue to bring you guys more episodes. Absolutely. One day I'm going to get you both on the program so we can really have some fun with it. Thanks a lot, my friend. Oh, man. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Speaking of small business. There's a lady by the name of Jennifer Garrett who will join me next after the break. Welcome back to the program, everybody. Hope you're enjoying it as we're enjoying bringing it to you. You know, I am a fan of podcasts. I 
record them, I produce them, and I listen to them, a lot of them. And this one got my attention, and you guys know that I've begun to recommend a lot of good podcasts for y'all to listen to. Well, this one not only involves sports, it also involves life. And when I listened to it, I knew, well, when I heard about it, I knew I had to listen to it. I listened to it. I became a subscriber immediately, and I'm going to recommend this even before we get this done. The lady that I have on the line is the author of said podcast, Combining Football and Life. And when you listen to this podcast, you are going to get a lot out of it. And I recommend you not only sign up for it, download it, I, I just recommend everything about it. This is Jennifer Garrett, and she joins me right now. How are you doing? Hey, thanks so much for having me. I'm doing great. Okay, you got to tell me how you put this podcast together. What gave you the idea and what what gave you the inspiration to put it together? Sure. So my podcast is called Move the Ball, and that name was taken from a book that I wrote uh, seven years ago. And the book was about how you could take football lessons specifically and apply them off the field to be successful in business and in life. And after the book was published, I spent the last seven years really working with people on how to move the ball and um, and really grow that brand. And, and I decided that I wanted to do the podcast because it was just another great way to connect with people having great conversations with professional athletes of all sports as well as business leaders on how we can use the athlete mentality and put into practice success strategies and habits so that we can get ourselves to the next level. You started the podcast the day after the Super Bowl. You really you really pumped it up. And I have to tell you, I, I really enjoy it. I know I'm going to enjoy it a lot. Um, what got you into football? What got you started in liking football? Great question. So I grew up in Chicago uh, in the 80s. I just fell in love with the game. You know, Ever since I was four, I, I would watch football games with my parents. And what really intrigued me about the sport was not only the fast-paced nature of the game, but also there were these games where you would have these fourth-quarter comebacks where teams mm-hmm. were down you know, two, three, four touchdowns. And the game wasn't over until the game clock hit zero. And so I just found that fascinating and studied the sport my entire life and applied lessons from the game into my own life. That is great. So you grew up a ba- you grew up a fan of Dub Bears back in the eighties, huh? Because I too am from Chicago, and I've seen I've seen the Bears over 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 many many years. Are there any other teams that you follow aside of the Bears? Uh, professional or college or either. Either one. So I am an Alabama alum, so I very much follow the University of Alabama football team. We had a rough uh, rough season here this past season, but they'll be back next year for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I could have you on the show, and all I have to say is roll tide and off to the races we go. How about, how about a professional aside of the Bears? you follow anyone else? Uh, you know, there's a lot of teams that I like to watch. Um, I think there's some great uh, leaders who are great people both on and off the field. So it's not just the talent, but it's the character. You know, everyone talks about Tom Brady, right, and how great he was in New England. We'll see where he ends up going. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do enjoy watching that team because of the leadership. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that don't like watching the team. Well, people have hated on my team because – my original team in professional uh, football was the 49ers, and because of a fellow named Joe Montana, who Tom Brady gets compared to all the time. So I completely understand, you know, the hatred, but I draw the same comparison that people do with Tom Brady and the Patriots. It's because of the way that uh, Montana led his team on the field and the way the organization is run. And a lot of that you can apply to what you do with your, what you do with your podcast, which is very motivational, and I absolutely love it. And the lessons that you bring, you know, you can, like you said, you can apply it to life. Yeah. So I say, you know, I do like watching the Patriots. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of great teams. I, I do like Andy Reid. You know, congratulations to the Kansas City Chiefs Absolutely. for uh, for winning the Super Bowl. I mean, Patrick Mahomes is just a class class act. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed watching the game. You know, 
organization. Um, I've, there's some NFC East teams that I like watching, you know, mm-hmm. the Eagles. I like watching the Cowboys. And so, I mean, I, I'm just a, a fan of the game and I love watching good games. So I don't just sit yes. down and watch the Bears play. <laughs> 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 Absolutely wonderful. Talking with Jennifer Garrett, I love a phrase that I happened to catch when I was doing my, my research for this interview, and I, I love how you put this. Quote, you are the quarterback, your life is the game. Own it and move the ball. There's your purpose right there for, for your podcast. Who are some of the guests that you've taped episodes with or are going to tape episodes with so far? Sure. So the first three episodes were released uh, just this past week. The first one was just a solo of me, but I had on the show already Chris Leak. Chris was the quarterback who led the Florida Gators to their national championship in the Mm -hmm. 2006 season. So he was right before Tim Tebow. Um, Tebow was a freshman when Chris was a senior taking that team to their championship. Also, I I had on uh, Terrence Wood, who is the grandson of Hall of Famer, Pro Football Hall of Famer Willie Wood, Mm -hmm. who played for the Packers in the 1960s. Uh, Some other guests that I've recorded with already, Paul Pratt. Paul played with the Detroit Lions, and he's got a great organization called Second Wind Mentors, where he mentors young boys of single-parent homes currently. So we had a great episode. Another gentleman, Tony Simmons. Tony played on the Patriots. He played on a number of of teams he was nicknamed touchdown tony played at wisconsin for Mm -hmm. um college ball some future guests that are coming up as well uh eric dungy who is the son of tony dungy well we're going to be recording an episode here in a couple weeks um but it's not just football athletes so i've also got a pro skateboarder mikey taylor who i recorded a show with his episode will come out early march um also rob murray rob played in the national hockey league and the american hockey league for many years he's currently coaching the tulsa oilers which is a minor league hockey team so my goal is really a good cross section of athletes from all sports absolutely wonderful again this is jennifer garrett you can find her you can find her podcast on anywhere where you listen to it's called move the ball it's the Move the Ball podcast, and it's absolutely wonderful. Tell everybody where they can find you, my dear. Yeah, so the easiest way, I mean, it's going to be on all the platforms, or it is on all the platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. But if you just go to movetheballpodcast.com, you can listen to it directly there, and there are links to all of those other podcasting platforms. Jennifer Garrett joining me here on the program to talk Move the Ball and how she uses football to move the ball in life, and you can do the same thing. Absolutely great having you on. i got to have you on again soon. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate being on the show today. we got more coming up in a smidge. Welcome back to the program, folks, as we continue to get you through your week. want to thank you for tuning in on all of our favorite networks, all of our favorite stations, internationally and nationally, and through the Internet. A few years ago, I had a fellow on this program talking about bringing Major League Baseball to Charlotte, North Carolina. And when I closed that conversation... The next time I wanted to talk to him, I wanted to be in North Carolina. Well, that time has come, and Rick Curdy is back, and he's on the hotline right now. How are you, my friend? Good to talk to you. Hey there. How are you, Snowman? How's everything going? Everything is great. I finally made it down here to North Carolina, man. All right, man. <laughs> <laughs> That was one of the things we had uh, talked about. I wanted to come down here, and then my wife jumped at the opportunity with me, so we're here. How has that How has that movement been going? Because it's been a while since we talked about it. Yeah, it's been going on strong. You know, we've been uh, we actually have a podcast now called Charlotte Bass Baseball and, and Sports. Um, it's just been growing like crazy, 
the enthusiasm is so high right now for it. People really want to see it. Um, we got Major League Soccer. We didn't get MLB. We got MLS mm-hmm. coming in 2021. So um, that's a great thing because I think right around the corner is Major League Baseball. So um, yeah. I think Charlotte is showing that we're a great city for professional sports. So um, we already got the basketball and the football, and now we got the soccer, and we got the hockey in Raleigh. And the only thing we're waiting for is Major League Baseball. So yeah. um, let's bring it on. Yeah, that's all that's missing. Um, as uh, Rick just mentioned, the Hurricanes are in Raleigh. You got the Carolina Panthers. They play out of Charlotte. Of course, the Charlotte Hornets. Um, Major League Soccer is now in Charlotte. Of course, Major League Baseball would be a godsend for this area because a lot of folks are excited about baseball. In the short time that I've been here, it uh, the the excitement and talking about Major League Baseball possibly coming to Charlotte, it's been off the charts. Yeah, it's it's been through the roof. People are excited. You know, the night uh, will be starting soon. Their attendance is one of the highest in all of my league baseball has been since they come to Uptown Charlotte. Um People want to see it. You know, people are ready to see it. And, uh, you know, the only thing holding us up, unfortunately, is uh, the stadiums in Oakland and Tampa. And I just don't understand for the life of me why Tampa's still there. You know, they are a great team, but their fan base stinks. It's yeah. been bad since day one. And now I heard this ridiculous thing that Major League Baseball is thinking about splitting the Tampa Bay Rays season in Montreal, which mm-hmm. makes absolutely no sense. I don't know how that's going to grow baseball floor if you're going to be playing not only in another place in another country. So I I think it's crazy that they want to do that. But I mean, um, I think if the Rays don't get a new stadium by 2027 when their at least expires, they are definitely going to move, and it's either they're going to move to Montreal, or are they going to move to Portland, or are they going to move to Charlotte? And you said the the last time I had you on, you know, I, I had asked you how long will it take for Major League Baseball to come to Charlotte, and you had mentioned something. You said they may go, they may try to go back to Montreal first, and I know that report that you're talking about, and it just leads right into what you, you said the last time you were here, and you just repeated it. Yeah, much. They want they want uh, baseball to come back to Montreal, and a lot of people said, "Well, they had it there and it failed." They were there for thirty years, and to me, it wasn't the people that failed it. It was Jeffrey Loria who failed it. He's the one that you know sent them packing and led mm-hmm. them eventually to become the to the Washington Nationals. So it was actually Jeffrey Loria that failed the organization and. You know, when when you know your team's leaving, why come to the games? You know, it's just like the Raiders. When the Raider fans knew they were moved to Las Vegas, they just stopped showing up. Mm-hmm. So um, eventually, you know, they moved to Washington, and, of course, they won the World Series. So um, I, the Major League Baseball wants to be more global. They're kind of following the model of, of basketball and the NFL, where they're playing games in other countries. Major League Baseball just had a, a series. Uh, in London, first yeah. time they were playing in London, that was pretty wild. And uh, they want to go play games in the um, in Mexico um, and other countries. And you know, the NBA play games in China. Of course, the NFL plays games in Mexico and London, and and now I'm, th- I'm here in Toronto. So um, that's what Major League Baseball wants to do, and they want to see two teams in Canada, so and have a nice rivalry with Montreal and. Uh, and um, Toronto, so it's inevitable. Montreal's coming back. The Expos' names coming back, but it, they always expand by two. So the question is, who's going to join Montreal? Is it going to be Montreal, Charlotte, Montreal, Portland, Montreal, Nashville? You know, or you know, it could be any of those six cities that they have on the list. And they want to follow the same pattern of uh, the NBA in growing by two. You know what? I know I've asked this before, and I'm going to keep asking sure. it. And I've gotten I've gotten so many great answers. What would be the biggest selling point of bringing Major League Baseball to Charlotte, North Carolina? Well, we already have the football. We already have the basketball. That was one of the reasons why 
uh, Commissioner Manfred put Charlotte on the list because they have already proven they can support professional sports. Uh, to me, our biggest selling point is not only do we have so many transplants, not only do we have the money here with all the banks out here, yeah, um, but uh, we also have another state next door to us in South Carolina, mm-hmm. and South Carolina does not have any professional sports. They have the Gamecocks, they have Clemson, and they have the Columbia Fireflies for a minor league baseball team. That is it. They're going to have the Panther headquarters out there very soon. That's it. There's no professional sports in South Carolina. And a lot of, you know, there's a reason to call the Carolina Panthers because mm-hmm. it's North and South Carolina. And we could do the same thing with our baseball team. We have a lot of passionate fans in South Carolina, all the way in Rock Hill and Fort Mill, Columbia, South Carolina, you know, I mean, even Charleston, all the way from Charleston or, uh, all over South Carolina, come to uh, Charlotte and watch a baseball game. So mm-hmm. I think that's our biggest selling point that we have that the other cities don't have. You know, uh, we have a sister state that's next door. So we're t- we are literally two states in one. Let's uh, reiterate something. When the Panthers were founded, were, when the Panthers were granted a franchise, and a lot of people seem to forget this because they've had their base in Charlotte for so many years, they played their inaugural season at Clemson, in Clemson, South Carolina. So that got yep. the buzz going about the Carolina Panthers in both states. Yep, yep, that's what they're doing. You know, and, and David Tepper is really putting emphasis on really calling the Carolina Panthers. You know, I, I'm, I'm sure he wants to get a new stadium built one day. And mm-hmm. I heard he wants to put a retractable roof uh, at the uh, Bank of America. Right now they're modifying it for major league soccer right now so um, i think it's inevitable he'll he'll want to get a, a a brand new stadium and i keep hearing rumors that might be built near carowinds on the north and south carolina border if mm-hmm. that's where they want to move it we don't know it's just speculation so we'll see what happens with that but i think that's the big draw for north carolina is that we have south carolina next door and we have so many transplants nobody's from charlotte i'm not i'm from los angeles i think right. people here from New York and Yankee fans, I meet, you know, Dodger fans, I mean, Red Sox fans, I mean, <laughs> yes. well, a lot of people are from Florida who are, you know, Miami, uh, Dolph, uh, Marlins fans and so forth and so forth. So that, that's another big draw for us is that we have so many transplants here and our minor league baseball team is one of the top uh, attendants at all of minor league baseball. And uh, we already got the, the professional sport. So it's not, you know, if we get it, it's when we get it. And my question is, why Charlotte has never had it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's so wild that Charlotte has never had Major League Baseball. And for a, the longest time, it wasn't even considered. You know, I had thought, you know, for a long time, it would be such a boon for Major League Baseball to come to North Carolina. Yeah, I mean, we only have the true team for the South we have is the Atlanta Braves. I mean, yeah, we have uh, the Florida Marlins and you got the the uh, Astros and the Rangers, but like if you want to talk about like the true South, it's just it's Georgia and that's it. There's no teams in Tennessee. There's no Baisley baseball teams in Virginia. Our closest team is uh, four and a half hours in Smyrna, Georgia with the Braves and the second uh, closest team we have is in Washington, D.C. with the Nationals. So mm-hmm. you have all that open market with Virginia, all that open market with Tennessee, and it's just sitting there. It and is, the potential is great because, yeah. yeah, because we can get all those fans from the other states. So um, it's just perfect. And like I said, I, I, I would be shocked if Major League Baseball didn't pick North Carolina because they've been you know, kind of ignoring North Carolina for a while. And it's just, you can't ignore it because the numbers are there, the draw is there, and it'd be a great rivalry with Atlanta. And uh, you can have all those open markets with Virginia and all those open markets in South Carolina and all those open markets in Tennessee. And and we're not, nowhere near another market, four and a half hours there and right. nine and a half hours there. So it's it's just, it's perfect. It, it is perfect, and if you go all along the Atlantic coast, and just to reiterate a point that you just brought up a moment ago, 
all along the Atlantic coast, the, fur- the further Atlantic, uh, North Atlantic you get, you got the Washington Nationals, the defending world champions, and you got the Baltimore Orioles. If you come down the Atlantic, the furthest you go, you have Atlanta, and then you have Miami, and of course Tampa Bay, but nothing in between there. Nothing in Virginia, Kentucky, or Tennessee, or of course the Carolinas. So you got vacationers sitting right there looking for something to do which doesn't involve driving to Atlanta, which doesn't involve driving to New Orleans. You got that whole you got that whole Atlantic coast area wide open. Exactly, exactly. And um, I think Major League Baseball needs more teams in the South. We have a ton of teams on the West Coast. We have tons of teams in the East Coast. Um the only market that's not really expanding anywhere is is the South, which is Georgia, Florida, Texas. And that's it, you know, and North Carolina would be perfect. And really North and South Carolina would be perfect because we'd be representing two states. So it's just, uh, to me, it's just inevitable that Major League Baseball will come to North Carolina. Uh, I think it's inevitable also. Rick Curdy joining me. Join his movement of bringing Major League Baseball to Charlotte, North Carolina. I am a staunch supporter of it. Now being a Carolina resident, I want you all to get behind this movement also. Tell everybody where they can sign, where they can join the movement and tell everybody where they can find you, my friend. Well, you can check out our website. We have a petition on there at www.charlottebats.com. We're on Twitter at Charlotte Bats Baseball. We're also on Facebook at Charlotte Bats. And we're also on LinkedIn at Charlotte Bats. So we're Charlotte Bats everywhere. We're also on the Instagram at Charlotte Bats. And you can just contact me at charlottebatsbaseball at gmail.com. If you have any questions, concerns, you want to join our movement, we're actually looking for interns uh, to help promote. So um, come aboard and love to hear from you. And uh, let's all do this together. Let's make this happen. Let's make the Charlotte Bats happen, folks. Rick Curdy joining me. Thanks a lot, my friend. Appreciate it. And uh, I'll put this out there. Look forward to working with you in the future. Thanks, Nomad. Congrats on your wedding. Appreciate it. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. We got more stuff for you. Hang tight. I'll be back in a flash. This is No Man in the Morning. Where true sports talk lives. He did what? I did not need to be told that. Okay. We're back here on the program. And thank you for joining me. Let's, uh... Let's talk NBA All-Star Game, shall we? Now... Before I launch into what I'm going to talk about, I think, or I know, that the NBA is doing a wonderful thing in honoring the memory of one Kobe Bryant. Okay? But there's a new format that they have put together in honoring Kobe Bryant. SBNation.com wrote this. The NBA is changing its format of the 2020 All-Star Game to spice up the competitiveness of the event and honor Kobe Bryant. After years of criticism over the game's fading audience, the leagues made numerous new rules. Here's what's new. The first three quarters of the 2020 All-Star Game will have the score reset after each 12-minute period. Team LeBron and Team Giannis will will compete to win each frame at a score of 0-0. The winner of each quarter will earn $100,000 for their charity with ties resulting in the money being added to the following quarter. The score resets after each quarter, but the cumulative total still matters. The cumulative total still matters. I pronounced that wrong. I'm sorry. 
In the fourth quarter, the team's scores from the first three quarters will be added up. And the final score a team needs to reach to win the game will be determined by adding 24 points, Bryant's jersey number, to the highest scores total. There will be no game clock in the final frame. The first team to hit that point total wins. If that was a lot and hard for you to understand, it's because the new format is confusing as hell. Again, this is on SBNation.com, so let's go a step further. They provide this example. Let's start with the beginning of the game. If Team LeBron scores 30 and Team Yana scores 25 in the first quarter, Team LeBron's charity of choice wins $100,000. In quarter two, the score resets to 0-0. So Team Giannis could outscore Team LeBron by the same score, 30-25, to and they win $100,000 for their charity. In quarter three, the same thing happens. Let's say Team LeBron outscores Team Giannis 30-25 to again. Team LeBron wins 100000 for charity once again. In the fourth quarter, the score from the first three quarters will be added up. In this case, Team LeBron is leading Team Giannis 85-80. to Instead of a 12-minute game clock, the teams will play to a score. In this case, we take 85 points as leading score and add 24 points to Honor Bryant. So the first team to 109 points wins the game. <laughs> I I I must have looked at this a hundred times. I must have read this a hundred times. I still don't understand how the hell this is going to bring competitiveness back to the game. So you're putting $100,000 on the line each quarter for the team's favorite charity. You know, that part I actually like. I actually like that part. But you're going to reset the score to 0-0 for the second and the third quarters. But you keep a running score at the table. You keep a running score at the table for the fourth quarter uh, up until the. I. I don't get this at all. I don't get this at all. So you're gonna reset the you're gonna reset the score after every quarter. I I I just I don't get it. I just have one question and one question only. I demand to know who wrote this script. Because I sure as hell didn't write it. I sure as hell didn't write it. You want to honor Kobe Bryant? How about playing as hard as you can on both ends of the floor? You want to honor Kobe Bryant? How about um, your honorary captains, one wears two, the other wears 24? You want to honor Kobe Bryant and bring the fans back to the game? How about some competition? Everybody wants to say, oh, it wasn't fair because the West was so stacked. Well, if fans of the East are complaining that the West is so stacked, so stacked, why don't you beat them? Why don't you play hard? Why don't you just play basketball? I understand that the fans have waned off of this game. I'm going to have Michael Lyle on on Friday. I want to talk about this very subject. 
Can someone please explain to me how the hell this is going to work? Can someone please explain to me how this brings competition back to a game where competition has faded by not circumventing the rules? Because that's what you did. You completely circumvented the rules. You completely revamped a format that for a while worked because the players actually loved playing against each other. I thought that was the whole idea of the All-Star game anyway. Not just the dunks, not just the three-pointers, not just the fancy assists. But you play hard. That you actually play basketball. that you actually have the coaches coach and the players play. Am I missing something here? Again, I pose the question. I demand to know who wrote this script. I'd like to tell him, but uh, <laughs> modesty forbids. That's probably what Adam Silver is saying. That is probably what Adam Silver is saying. I'd like to tell him, but <laughs> modesty forbids. So modesty also forbids actually playing a game where the teams were identified as East and West. You know, this, this team captain stuff is getting on my nerve. It's getting on my nerve. These new rules I know are going to drive me batty. These new these all-star game rules are going to drive me absolutely batty. These new I just don't get it. I don't understand why they are going to why well, okay let me say this they're going to honor Kobe Bryant yes absolutely yes okay i get that and i'm not dismissing it and i'm glad they are going to honor Kobe Bryant But you're going to do it like this. You're going to do it completely blowing up the rules. You're going to do it completely and unequivocally, for lack of a better term, messing up the game, messing up the integrity of the game by these rules? Really? Really? You're going to do something like that to honor Kobe Bryant when he was known as the Black Mamba, when his work ethic was celebrated, when his work ethic was that of legend, and this is how you honor Kobe in an all-star game? This is how you honor him? Really? This is how you actually plan to honor him. No, not by playing hard, not by actually playing defense, which is where Kobe Bryant excelled, not by putting in the work with your all-star teammates, not by saying, hey, let's go out there and have a competitive game. Let's go out there and... Uh, and and not only have fun, but play hard and have a great game. No, none of that. These are the rules you come up with?
I have no words. I am really stunned into silence that they're going to do this. I just don't get it. I just don't get it. That snowman's take, what's yours? I'll never, I'll, I'll, I won't get it. I just don't understand it. I just will not understand it at all. Back after this. This is No Man in the Morning. I did not need to be told that. Where true sports talk lives. Excellent. Can't wait. He's back, and we're ready to talk all things <laughs> NBA <laughs> NBA All-Star Game. <laughs> William Morgan, one of my basketball aficionados, is back. How are you, my friend? Hey, nice to be back, man. Okay. I talked about this on Friday with my buddy Michael Lyle and one of my good friends, Darnell Solins. Who the hell came up with these rules for this year's All Star Game? <laughs> uh, <laughs> the thing that kills me, they're doing it to me. They're doing it to try to increase viewership. But the thing about it, the names are so big, you're gonna get it. You're gonna get views from it regardless. Mm -hmm. Why can't That's it the thing be? Killing me. Why can't it be East and West again? Right. Can we just go back to East and West? Uh, that, that, I'm, I'm there with you. I'm there with you. Particularly with the way Giannis picks, he's picking his best friends. Yes. This is why I don't like the captains. This is exactly why I don't like the captains. Because remember, the first year it was LeBron and Steph. And yep. to be perfectly honest, Steph got screwed out of a couple of great players to be on his team. He did. Steph got screwed, okay? He did. He did. So why can't it be just East and West? I, I guess the East got tired of getting beat up by the West. Like if you want, the, if you want to be the team, beat the team. Exactly. Why don't people get this concept? Exactly. And, now, and, 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 and 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 to be fair, Giannis probably been thinking the same way you were thinking mm -hmm. because most of that team is from the Eastern Conference. Yes. So it should be East and West anyway. They just yep. need to call it East and West and, and, and be done. This year's All-Star Game is in Chicago, my hometown. Mm -hmm. It's in the United Center. Last time it was in Chicago, it graced old Chicago Stadium. That, of course, was 1988. Here are the rules as I understand them, and you're allowed to laugh mm -hmm. at any given time that I try to explain this. Okay. Each team, each quarter begins 0-0. Zero, zero. So, if Team LeBron beats Team Giannis, say, 30 to 25, then Team LeBron wins $100,000 for the charity of their choice. Okay. Then you reset the score. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you know this is going to sound crazy. Then you reset the score for quarter two, and if Giannis beats LeBron by that same score then Team Giannis wins $100,000 for the charity of their choice. You reset the score again for quarter three. And remember, each of the first three periods are 12-minute quarters. You reset for period three, and if LeBron wins, if Team LeBron wins again, then they get 100000 bucks for their charity. Now, if the quarter ends in a tie... Then you roll the money over to the next quarter, and whoever wins the quarter get wins the whole pot for their charity. Right, folks. I'm as tongue tied as you are <laughs> trying to <laughs> decipher this mess. Uh, now, what happened here's to the, the kicker. Here's the kicker. I didn't give you the best part. The first three quarters uh, are twelve minute quarters. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The fourth quarter is an untimed quarter. So they take the cumulative score of the first three periods, say Team LeBron leads 
all Team LeBron would have to do to win the game, and this is where they honor Kobe, is tack on 24 points. There you go. So if Team LeBron scores, a whoever scores 109, and this is the example that I was given, then that team would win the All-Star game. I have so many questions, which begin with, why the hell wouldn't you keep the running score anyway? Right. <laughs> right. I don't get it. What what ha- what has happened to the days of us having a traditional All Star weekend? Now, if you want to do a slam dunk competition, the three point shootout, um, you can do a big man's competition. You can do a one on one, which I would love to see mm-hmm. um, between certain players. I mean, bring, uh, and then you do the traditional All Star game. Bring back, you know something? Bring back the old timers game. Yeah, you got enough folks that. Bring back the old timers game, okay? Yep. That was one of the features of the weekend. I'm, I'm with you. You play two halves, making a running clock. You're good. Bring back the old I'm timers game. This I'm with you. This skills competition, for lack of a better term, to me mm-hmm. is boring. <laughs> it is. It is. I understand the slam dunk. I understand the three-point competition, and nothing will top 1988 when Michael Jordan won in front of his hometown hometown fans. Okay. Oh yeah. That's when oh, Michael yeah. Jordan tore the roof off the joint. Yep. What has happened? And, and I'm I, I plan to have Courtney Harden on later this week to discuss this same subject that we discussed a few years ago. What has happened to All Star Weekend? What has happened to the luster? That is All Star Weekend. <sighs> corporate spot, corporate, I believe, plays their hand in it, so mm-hmm. to speak. Mm-hmm. And certain players, and certain players, not wanting to compete, or certain players dropping out after they said they would compete that you would want to see. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking that those are the two biggest factors on why this All Star Weekend isn't what it used to be. And it's just a damn shame because I can remember, man, like it was yesterday, um, Dominique, Spud, Jordan, all those for the oh, slam dunk nice. competition. But, but yet and still, yet and still, you got LeBron James who won't do it. You know what? I've always had a problem with that. I understand. Can- Look, MJ put in his, his years as a slam dunk king. All right. Mm-hmm. He had nothing mm-hmm. more to prove on that realm. Then, of course, he goes on and wins six championships. Mm-hmm. He had nothing left to prove. Why do you think LeBron James will not get in the slam dunk competition? What's up with that? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe not now in year 17, but back when it was year 9, year 10. He could have easily eight, participated. He could have easily yep. participated. Yep. And let's not forget it. Let's not forget this also. Jordan embarrassed himself in the three point competition. Yeah, he did. But at least he went out there and, but at least he went out there and tried. Mm-hmm. And Braun can't try to slam dunk. And it, you would think it would be one of his specialties. Yeah. You would think yeah. it would be one of his specialties. Here's a funny yeah. moment. Here's a funny moment. And I, I know a lot of LeBron fans are going to get on me about this. But. You honor Kobe in the Staples Center. If you're the Lakers and Lakers fans, I'd be a little upset for this reason. You honor Kobe on a Friday night, a full house, a lot of folks watching outside, and then you go out and lay an egg against the Portland Trailblazers. (laughs) Yeah, that's a problem. They (laughs) They laid a big fat egg against the Portland Trailblazers. They That's allowed a hundred. They allowed a hundred twenty-seven points to the Portland Trailblazers. And also, if you're a Lakers fan, yeah. I'd be worried about this. You're playing the worst team in the league in the Golden State Warriors. Why did you allow them to hang around on Saturday night? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why and did the you Lakers allow them? Are to, playing, they're not playing their best ball right now. No, they're what? They're playing five hundred ball the last eleven, twelve games. They're yes, five hundred ball right now. So. 
they're not looking very, very good. <clears throat> and, and in many and ways, the neither are the in the many ways neither are the Clippers. They got smashed by the Minnesota Timberwolves on oh, Saturday yeah. night. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh if yeah. You're, if like, you're but, playing the worst team in the league, and I go back to the Lakers, if you're playing the worst team in the league, and you allow mm-hmm. them to hang 120 points on you, yeah, you win by five mm-hmm. in San Francisco. But remember, this is the same Warriors team playing shorthanded that beat the Houston Rockets by a dozen on Christmas Day. Yep. Yep. Amen. Amen. They should be they, they should be ashamed of themselves. They should be getting up. They play down to their competition, mm-hmm. and they should. Have. And, and, they and should that's have. and for me, that's always been an issue with LeBron playing down mm-hmm. to his competition. I'm sorry, I have to speak it the way it is truthfully seen by my eyes. It just yes, seems sir. that with LeBron, even though he's in year 17, he plays down to his competition. Yep. He plays down to his competition. He's always, since he's been in the NBA, and we're talking about an incredible 17-year career, we're talking about since 2003, doesn't it seem to you, and I'm not trying to put words in your mouth at all, but just follow me here. Doesn't it seem huh? to you like he's playing down to his competition instead of up? Yes. Yes. So I believe you. So why has he not gotten the message yet that he has a bullseye on his back and has for 17 years? He needs to, because a lot of these games, everybody keeps saying that LeBron is this, LeBron is that better than Jordan. But the thing that's killing LeBron, I think it's his thought process in these games. Mm -hmm. Instead of coming out and taking over and setting the tone for for his team and getting AD in, and and he's trying to pass too much. He's trying to defer too much. Uh, AD is fine, because you got to feed AD in the post. That's fine. Absolutely. But... We, but when you're trying to get guys, other guys who've come up short this year, i.e. Kyle Kuzma, mm-hmm. you, you can't do that. You need to come out and be the tone setter. Get your own game going. Once you get your game going and your shot falling, then you go ahead and start facilitating to, uh, to AD and other people. But get your game going first. And a lot of times out of LeBron, you don't see that. You really don't. And... He's so afraid, in my opinion, in a lot of games, he's so afraid to get his game going because he doesn't want to take away from others. And that part I don't understand. That's a lot of MJ, okay? But oh, the yeah. difference is oh, yeah. but the difference is Michael knew he can take over a game at any given time. Yep. Yep. Exactly. The biggest difference exactly. is Michael knew he can take the game over at any time. So and you're even seeing, and if you even look at, and I'm going to cut you off, but even if you look at LeBron, he's even being exploited defensively. Yeah. He's been exploited defensively for the last five years. Mm-hmm. And everybody wants to go back, go back to that chase down block in 2016 when he got Andre Iguodala. And I'm so sad that I'm so glad the next year the Warriors got even, but that's a discussion for yeah. another time. <laughs> like, oh, that's the greatest defensive play I've seen in finals history. Please. I've yeah. seen much better, much earlier. Uh, apparently, if that's the greatest defense play, the chase down block by LeBron, if that, the greatest, if that is the greatest defense play that you see in the NBA World Championship Series, obviously you haven't seen Larry Bird do his thing. Obviously, you haven't seen oh, Magic yeah. Johnson or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar do his thing. Obviously, you haven't seen oh, yeah. the bad boy Detroit Pistons do their thing. The Bulls, the Spurs. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah mm-hmm. I'm going there. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm going all the way there. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you haven't seen those teams do their thing. Okay? Yep. Even though at- they lost the other night, and even though they lost the other night, I still like the Clippers coming out of the West Yeah. because their, their strengths – or a they got that dog in them, but b look at look at what they hit you with. Mm-hmm. They hit you with those start, and then they bring Morris. They bring Lou Williams off the bench. Oh my goodness! Yeah. And while the Lakers are 
and the Lakers are long and yep. they're tall as a team, but, but they're, they're short on the bench. Right. They're short on the bench. You can't count on Rondo anymore. No. Nope. I don't know what you you might get some you might get something off Caruso because um, he'll probably take Rondo's minutes now. But for the most part, I'm I'm loving the Clippers right now. I'm Clippers Bucks. I'm calling it now. You know something. Here is a move the Lakers should have made, and I said this on Friday's NBA podcast, and I'm mm-hmm. saying it now, and I think you'll agree with me. The fact that the Lakers didn't even blink trying to get Andre Iguodala is an mm-hmm. indictment against the Lakers. I think it's more on an indictment on the fact that <laughs> they're trying to keep their core and they look at they look at Danny Green, they look at Kyle Kuzma as part of their core. And you look at LeBron, you you, you you look at Kuz, you look at Danny Green, look at A D. That's what they want. Anybody else is up for trade. The problem is nobody else wants those players. No. And I wouldn't either. That's the problem. And I wouldn't yeah, either. That's the problem. I wouldn't want them either. I mean, why would you even take that? Why would you even take that chance? Nope. Why would you even take that chance? And again, I say that the lack of moves by the Lakers, especially when Andre Iguodala has been available all season, is yep. an indictment against the Lakers because it shows me they don't want to win because they had a chance to get a proven winner. Nothing against LeBron. Nothing. Nothing against AD. Nothing against um, Rajon Rondo. But you had a chance to get a proven winner in Andre Iguodala. Three championships in five seasons. He was in the best yep. culture. He was in the best basketball culture for eight years. And you didn't Agreed. go after him. Why? Another thing that another thing that's indicted that that's kinda got me upset too. If you really, really wanted to trade Kyle Kuzma, they didn't showcase him at all. Nope. You could have showcased him within that second unit, but they mm-hmm. didn't do it. Nope. And they don't want to do it. Mm-mm. My feeling is they don't they don't want to do it. They want to hold on to him in case some even bigger trade bait or, or free agency bait comes around, i.e. Carl Anthony Towns. But I'm gonna tell you but something. See, I'm, thinking, I'm gonna tell you something mm-hmm. that a lot of people don't think will happen, but I think will. Mm-hmm. Carl Anthony Towns mm-hmm. will end up in the bay. I think so too. I think so too. I think so because now they have assets. Now they have assets to yep. do by getting rid of um, D'Angelo. So they have some assets. So mm-hmm. I, I can see that happening. They, and they, and, and they Rob snatched, Flinker, they snatched Andrew Wiggins. The Warriors snatched Andrew Rig- Wiggins in a one-on-one trade for D'Angelo Russell. Now Russell yep. is busy. Pr- has been proving himself all year. I understand that, but the Warriors need mm-hmm. some depth on that bench. And they're getting it. And they're also getting a lot of draft picks. Here is the biggest piece of the puzzle that I see happening this summer. And if I'm totally wrong, I am totally wrong. Mm -hmm. All these draft picks that the Warriors have available, they'll be a, I say they will still be able to get Carl Anthony Towns and not sacrifice one of them. They might. They might. It may if they cost anything for Golden State, it'll be the same kind of deal that the 49ers made for Jimmy Garoppolo. Give up a second round pick yes. and you get your franchise quarterback. They'll give up right. a second the Warriors yeah. will give up a second round pick, if not two, and they'll get mm-hmm. another franchise player that they can keep in their system for a good four to five years. Because they have their they core. Go. They have their mm-hmm. core. They got Stephen Curry, they got Clay Thompson, they got Draymond Green. Okay, Mm -hmm. and Green is the only one Mm -hmm. that's been healthy all year long. My point is, they can easily, easily talk to Minnesota and say, look, we'll give you a few second round picks if you give us Carl Anthony Towns, because now you get Minnesota thinking young again. They already gave up Andrew Wiggins for a song, and I got nothing against D'Angelo Russell at all. Don't get me wrong. Nothing against D'Angelo Russell at all. (laughs) Yep. Nothing against D'Angelo Russell at all. But at the same time, 
at the same time, the Warriors are thinking four or five years down the road when they rule the yep. roost again. I have a feeling yep. this summer Carl Anthony Towns will come to San Francisco, and he won't even blink I, when they make their offer. I can see that. I can see that. I can see that because it's a winning culture. And they'll have Andrew Wiggins there to be Harrison Barnes 2.0. Yep. So I, I, I can definitely see that. And I can you, definitely see that. And you can see the Warriors rebuilding right in front of our eyes, and no one will, no one will say it. No one will say it because everybody – that thinks they're an NBA fan, and you and I have spoken about this before, any and everybody that thinks they're an NBA fan are celebrating the fact that the Warriors are having an awful season in the midst of their dynasty. And they're still a dynasty mm -hmm. because they've won three titles in five years. This is a yeah. horrible year because they lost Kevin Durant to free agency. You lose Clay Thompson yep. in the World Championship Series. You lose Stephen Curry at the top of the season. I mean, what are you going to do? You, you're without three of your best players. And Kevin Durant right. hasn't played one minute this season, and I don't think he'll play one minute next season. I don't think he'll play for two years. And he's going to uh. languish in Brooklyn. Unless that injury heals the way it is supposed to heal and the way he wants it to heal, because you're talking about one of the most gifted, athletic seven-footers with a consistent jump shot. Pay attention, LeBron. With a consistent <laughs> jump shot that can knock it down from anywhere as well as post people up, that, in that ACL injury is going to mess him up for two years. Because if you look at yeah. all the reports... And if you know anything about physiology, that MCL injury takes two years to heal. Two years. So Clay Thompson is lost for this year. We all know that. He's probably going to be yep. back in October because we uh, the Warriors lost him in June. Okay? Mm -hmm. So when June comes around, it'll be one full year. You give him another five months on top of that, he'll be fine. Stephen Curry will be fine. Yeah. Kevin Durant won it. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and, and, and he still won't be 100%. He might be maybe, what, 80, 85? If that. Yeah. If that. He won't be 100%. He won't be 100%. And also... Yeah, he may have to adjust... Now to adjust his game a little bit. And, my, and also, who's to say Kyrie Irving will be there after this year? The way this year is going. Man, forward. look. Man, look. I am a... <laughs> I am a spitzer. I am a spitzer... Uh, Spencer Dunwoody fan. Mm -hmm. Dunwoody, I'm sorry. And I, I am a big fan of his. He's doing it when he's not, when Irving's not in there. He's been passing the job of running the team and he's been doing a doggone good job and making a lot less money. So if Kyrie Irving got Kyrie Irving can't come back, hey, so be it. Though we, um, he's been doing a great job. He's been doing a fantastic job. And if he can't come back or can't come back healthy, you know, hey, you have somebody there who can run that point guard position. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the the Nets are a mess. Even though they're competing oh, yeah. for a playoff spot right now. Huge mess. They can Huge get, mess. Here's the point with, with the Nets. They can get to April, but this team won't get beyond April. Big problem. No. Can, can you imagine if the Nets was over in the West? It was the chance coming out of the West. They were not, not have, one shot coming out of the West. Not a chance at all. Not a chance mm -mm. at all. Not with the way this team's constructed. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. And there's a whole lot of disappointing teams in the league this year. Mm -hmm. um, the Nets, are, the, the Nets are so much disappointing. You look at the Philadelphia Seventy Sixers, oh, very disappointing, given the talent on that team. Miami's gotten stronger. Toronto's holding pat, um, and of course the Bucks. It is the Bucks. Mm -hmm. I mean. The, they're playing good basketball right now. Uh, that's the that's the team to beat right now. That's the team to beat. Well, you mentioned a team that I have not been sold on since they drafted Ben Simmons, and that's the Philadelphia 76ers. Mm -hmm. I said earlier in the season that Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid will cost Philadelphia more than enhance them. Ben Simmons can't make a jump shot. Joel Embiid's taking too many jump shots. He won't camp in the lane. <laughs> and, and another thing I don't understand about Joel Embiid, he be having the, the craziest injuries or reasons why he can't play. Ever. Right. It's like, what, stomach flu, stomach virus? Not saying that it's not devastating, but, bro, how old are you? Yeah. 
Yeah, that can, that can happen to anybody. Here's another here's another move the Lakers should have made, and they didn't. Why didn't they go after Derrick Rose? Because the Lakers are in desperate need in, of a point guard right now. Rajon Rondo is there's not the answer. There's a story out there, too, that I think Detroit wanted Caruso was going to give him Rose. Maybe he denied it. I wonder who denied that deal. I, I don't know. It could have been Palika. It could have been no, Bus. It, it ain't Palika. I don't know. Listen, it ain't Palika. <laughs> you and I both know, and by that evil laugh, you already know the answer. Palinka didn't deny that trade. <laughs> Come on. Who the, who the hell do you think denied uh, that trade? Yeah, we, we knew who he was. Who, the, was who the hell do you think, <laughs> whose name ain't Rob Palinka or Jeannie Buss, put the kibosh on that move? It was Bron. <laughs> it was Bron. And, 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 and if he did put the kibosh on it, it was stupid. Derrick Rose is playing very, very well right now. Yeah, and he he could have he could have been a benefit to to the Lakers. Mm-hmm. Um, inside out, inside outside game. Um, Danny Green posting up for three, some driving, penetrating, kicking back out to him, hitting, setting him up for the three point shot. Uh, but you you don't can't do that now because he, he he's gone. He's no. not, he's still at Detroit. In, and two moves were there for Los Angeles to make. They could have gotten Derrick Rose, and they couldn't got They could have gotten Andre Iguodala, and I'm yep. willing to bet you. I'm willing to bet you. There is one person and one person only who put the kibosh on both of those trades. Ron. Yep. And and I got a. I have another rumor in my head of why they're going after Ben Simmons. Mm. Whoa. I have this. I have this strange feeling because. Ben Simmons is a part of Clutch Sports. He is. They made it. Yeah. Who do you think? Yeah, he may have signed an extension with Philadelphia. But who do you think, and, and and, and nothing against the players, okay? This is just what I feel. Who do you think sniffing around trying to get Ben Simmons on his team? Oh, yeah. No uh, other team. You're wrong. Yeah, no other team wants Ben Simmons for the simplest of fact. Ben Simmons, for the life of me, cannot hit a jump shot. And I don't understand it either because I looked at him early in the season when he was over at um, over with Rico Hines doing those Rico Hines runs. He wasn't even trying to shoot then. Nope, and he ain't trying to shoot so now. No, nah, I don't get it. I don't understand it. You have to con- con- to continue to develop your game, and for some reason, it's like even if you get a mid range, the the model Rose has got a mid range. Even if you get a mid range game, it mm-hmm. will serve you well. He don't even have that. Demar Derozan's career is going to last a lot longer than Ben Simmons' career is because Ben Simmons, if he doesn't get traded to the Lakers within two years, Ben Simmons is finished. I think I think he'll be I think he'll be regarded as a bust um, if something doesn't happen within the next couple of years. Because if he's not going to take it upon himself to develop that jumper, at least Giannis developed the jump shot. Yep. You see Giannis taking more outside shots now. Um, that's what Ben Simmons needs to do. That's what Zion needs to do. And I don't understand and why I'm these players don't want to develop a jumper. And, and I'm not too high on Zion either. I've never been high on Zion Williamson. He, you know what? Th- we'll close with this point, and I want your I want your mm-hmm. thought on this before we close up shop here. Zion mm-hmm. Williamson is playing out of position. He is playing yeah. way out of position. If he were to lose yeah. forty pounds and really get in basketball shape. And develop a jump shot. He could be a two guard. Easy. Easy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He doesn't have the handles to be a point guard. He doesn't have the jump shot. to pull. He can pose people up. Yeah, because of his sheer size. Right. But. But. People will figure that out in a heartbeat. Just ask Harrison Barnes. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> he knows all about that. <laughs> he knows all about getting figured out. Just ask, Har- hey, just ask I'll Harrison go- Barnes. I've gone on. A, I've gone out and said I think Ja Morant's going to be a better rookie and a better overall player mm-hmm. between the two. Between the two, because he won't have the the weight issues that Zion's going to be facing with each and every year um, of his career. Uh, and particularly when he got drafted, because he got drafted, he's with a, he's with the Pelicans. You yeah. know that he's good down in New Orleans mm-hmm. now. All that interest there, and all that um, and all that red and red and black gumbo. And, and that's what everybody was afraid there. of. That's what everybody yeah. was afraid of when Zion got yeah. drafted. And why did it take this long? His weight is a problem. Yep. yep. <clears throat> and John ja may and John ja may stay in the game maybe ten more pounds of muscle, but outside of that. Oh, I think Josh can be a, 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 a better player than Zion, Zion overall. Ja is more developed than Zion yep. is. Ja actually yep. has a jump shot. Ja mm-hmm. actually has court knowledge. Mm-hmm. Ja actually is willing to make his game better. And then on the other end, despite his slender size, he does put effort on defense, too. That he does. He's going to be a defensive dynamo when he really gets developed. Got to go to a break, but let me thank William Morgan for coming on to the program, Talk All Things NBA. You'll hear this conversation on the NBA podcast. Thanks a lot, my friend. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, man. Have a great night. Well, I'm done for this edition of the program. I want to thank you for joining me. Don't forget to follow SNW Digital Media on your favorite social media outlet, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, and Pinterest. I'll be back tomorrow with another full program. Don't forget, have a great day. God bless. Remember to make your next move your best move. And always remember, if your dreams don't scare you, then they are not big enough. Dream big, do bigger. I am, and I hope you all are too. Until tomorrow, Snowman's out of here.